Let me ask you a question. Have you ever had students in your classroom who seem to just flit around the room dumping out all the toys and centers? Or maybe you teach threes and four-year-olds and you've also experienced this problem in your classroom. I'm thrilled to announce my new podcast series called Behavior Bites. For each of the six Behavior Bites episodes, I'll be joined by a special guest where we'll bite into behaviors that challenge us one episode at a time. Be sure you're subscribed to Elevating Early Childhood so you never miss an episode. Our first guest in this series is Dr. Carolyn Bob Green, the founder of Training You to Succeed at training, the letter U, to succeed.net. Today, she's here to talk with us about why do toddlers and older preschoolers wander around and dump toys in the classroom? Ready? Let's dive in. So welcome back, Carolyn. We are so excited to have you back here on Elevating Early Childhood. It's been a while. Woohoo! I'm so excited. Well, your last episode was so well received. And for those of you watching along, if you haven't already watched Carolyn's episode all about biting, (laughs) then you can go ahead and do that after this recording, because of course you don't want to miss any of the awesome stuff that Carolyn and I are going to chat about today. And so that brings me to our topic. I know that this is something every single early childhood teacher out there can relate to, especially teachers who work with toddlers, because it's very common with that age group. And that is, why do toddlers wander around the room and dump out all the toys, Carolyn? Enlighten us. Because It is so frustrating. To answer your question in short, why do children wander around the classroom and why do they dump toys? Those are two different things. And first, I'm going to address the wandering around the classroom. So whenever a child walks into the classroom, there are so many great things in the room and they don't know what to do. Um, A lot of times we don't take the time to show children how to play and how to interact in the environment that they're in because it doesn't look like their home. It doesn't look like a place that they've never been before. So what do they do? They kind of wander around and try to figure things out. It's kind of like us, like we need to buy that new dress, right? So we go to the mall and there are so many different stores. And imagine if it's a mall that you've never really been to before. And so you know what you want to find, but you just don't know where to go and what to do. So we can spend hours wandering around, wandering around the mall, going in and out of stores, just trying to find that one thing. So just think about that toddler who's in your classroom and they don't even know where to go or what to do or how to play. We have to give them direction. And a lot of times that that is the reason why they're wondering because they just don't know what to do. They don't know how to play or where to start. Then we get to once they do know where to go and what's in the classroom, we get into the dumping. They just start dumping things out. And if many of you know about, you know, milestones, early childhood development, that is a part of their development, dumping and pouring. So that's something that they have a need, that need needs to be fulfilled in some way. And we'll talk about how to fulfill that need. But understanding that that's why they are doing that can better help us come to a solution as to what we need to put in the environment in order for us to kind of control that dumping and pouring things all over the floor in the classroom. Yeah, and I think it's super important what you just said. I wanna reiterate it for our listeners. It's part of their development. I'm pretty positive. There's no toddler out there that is just sitting there thinking, I can't wait to get this lady and make her (laughs) angry. And so I'm gonna dump everything just to see the look on her face. Like that's not how they operate. They are doing this because it is in their developmental stages. It's in their milestones. They, this is something they have a need. They need to do this. And and because they're exploring their Mm -hmm. world, right? That's how kind of how little kids, they learn that way by exploring. And that's the stage of development where they're at. So what we know, I think that we all know is that we can't force children through Mm -hmm. stages. So we have to kind of work with them, right? And so I'm, I am interested to see how we can help improve that behavior or help guide them through it rather, because it's not a misbehavior that needs to be improved. It's like, how do we guide them through this 
and fulfill their, their need in the environment yeah. yes yes and as teachers i know it's frustrating to to have that wonderer <laughs> that wondering kid and to have the dumper um that's going around you're like i just put those toys in the center and they're just like all over the floor but when we have younger kids and they're putting things in their mouth which is another uh behavior bite um putting things in their mouth we kind of redirect them and tell them what to what to do and how to do that we don't see that as misbehavior but for some reason along the way uh toddler teachers have categorized dumping as a misbehavior and it's not misbehavior it is actually accomplishing a milestone. We just have to put it in the right category and and show them how to appropriately use it. That's great, you know. And I think another thing you said that really is is struck me is that maybe they don't know what to do with these things. Maybe they haven't been in a classroom setting before. Like all of this is new to them. Which store do I go to? Right. I love that mall analogy. I just want to make it clear to our listeners that even if you don't teach toddlers, you may experience this behavior in your classroom because I, as a teacher of four-year-olds, experienced this behavior quite a bit because even if uh, this is more common in the toddler years, we might have students in our classrooms in pre-K four who are developmentally yes. delayed. And if that's the case, then they could totally be going through this stage. And I can attest to the fact that many children do when they're four because they just haven't gone through that stage yet and they are acting in a way that is appropriate for their developmental level and they do have that need it needs to be fulfilled because i had many children over the years who would dump and run and wander as well (laughs) in a circle just around and around and around yeah yes and it's totally um something that i think all teachers and parents of children um should remember and you know another thing that you said that struck me too i was thinking about a family that i worked with not long ago this family shall remain nameless because they're related to me nameless family <laughs> <laughs> nameless family um they have a toddler at the time that this happened they had a toddler and um their toddler was you know perfectly behaved only child just lovely lovely child but whenever they would get together with their friends like all their friends had babies around the same age right the truth came out <laughs> Yes. And they they all came together and they were like, oh, we're going to have fun. We're going to sit around and watch our babies play together. This is what we always dreamed of. And then there was a lot of bopping on the head and a lot of dumping and running around. And they were like, uh, our child knows better. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah. They know how to behave with right. you in your mm-hmm. home when you play with them. When you put them in a room of other Two and three year olds, this is what happens. You know, this is normal. So it's just kind of funny that we see this as just the end of the world and it's really just Mm -hmm. normal. It's just normal that they just like genuinely don't understand what they should be doing. My favorite thing Mm -hmm. is when my toddler teachers say, Go play. Why are you standing here? Go play. It's like, go play well, like what does that actually mean like what does that look like because when they go play and if in their mind it means play superheroes and drop kick each other and punch each other in the throat <laughs> you have to explain and it's my it's one of the common words that's used in education is go play it's like go play what go play how do you play and we think that they know or their understanding of what play is is what we grew up knowing and understanding and it's not and when they go for it like you said bippity boppity boo upside the head is what happened because no one Mm -hmm. has taught them how to appropriately play or interact social skills with other children that they that are they age because they're at home with mom and dad and um in many of the situations i know in the classroom dad or mom rough plays with their kids sometimes like tickle them and throw them down to the ground and you know play kind of rough and so when that kid goes to play that's the example that they have right and that's what they do and it's yeah. totally okay but as early educators we have to lay that foundation by giving them the tools that they need to know how to appropriately interact in that environment absolutely so i think i think now we're all on the same page like we understand that all children go through this yeah we we understand that this is normal behavior it's a developmental stage that they are moving through we can be there to support them through it 
I think we, we've got that. How do we do that, though? Like, that's so easy to say, here's the problem and we know why. But how do we, if there is indeed a solution, what do we do? I believe in all situations, there is not just one correct answer, but I'm going to take you along the path that can lead to multiple solutions for the same uh, problem. So let's start with the wandering around the classroom. We all know that they are wondering because they just don't know what to do and how to do it. And one of the things that I tell teachers, whenever a child is new in the classroom, give them a classroom tour, um, show them all the wonderful things and how to actually play in that center. If you're just getting that group, incorporating that as a large group lesson and small group lesson. And I always tell my teachers, it's easier to loosen up than it is to tighten up. So even if you start by taking everybody into the block center and showing everybody how to interact and use those blocks and play with those blocks and then watch a few of them play with it while another one goes into a small group lesson with you, you have to actively show them what they can do and what the options are in your classroom and how to use the material. Otherwise, they will become overwhelmed. They'll get stuck and they'll just start planning the blocks and drop everything and then go over here, drop everything and go over here, drop everything and go over there. And they're just hopping around and wandering around the classroom with no <laughs> like just just going from everything because they don't know exactly what to do. So let's just take a moment back as toddler teachers and even as preschool teachers and kindergarten teachers and say, how can I give this child a full tour of this classroom, how to use these materials in the classroom, what this center has to offer, and how to engage with other kids in the center? And that is a lesson in itself. We can't make any assumptions. And that's the only way we're going to get down the path of controlling a little bit that wondering in the classroom. I love it. You know, you and I, obviously, I've said this before, we're on the same wavelength, but this this even proves it more because I actually have a script that I give to teachers. Uh, for those of you listening, it's my first 10 days of school uh, script where I say almost this exact thing. Like you, you need to take them all into the center. And this is where teachers always say to me, I don't have room for them all. Yeah, you get, mm -hmm. get creative. Like I would roll my block because I didn't have room in my block center for everybody, but I, you could move that shelving unit out into the middle of the room or wherever you could sit the kids down. I don't care if there's some of them are sitting over like in the housekeeping area that's close by because you're getting your noisy centers together. It doesn't matter as long as they can all see the blocks and they can all sit together. You can do that. And, and it's so important that you do because... You know, if you don't, what's the alternative? You know, you know it's going to be a lot of wondering <laughs> in the classroom. Exactly. This is the big reveal, right? This is the big reveal of the centers. And this these are the possibilities. And we can share those possibilities with our students and also kind of lay the foundation for how this whole classroom experience thing works. So it's super, super important. So I, I strongly encourage everyone out there listening or watching to make sure that you do that, right? And one of the things that um, I used to tell my kids, my two-year-olds and um, my younger threes is that toys don't walk. They don't have legs. So they're, they're not supposed to move from center to center to center. They're supposed to stay there and you have legs and you walk to those toys. And so I'll see a kid with a basket of toys because they want to take the blocks over to the dramatic place center. And I'm like, ah, can those toys walk? And they're like, no. <laughs> well, how are they moving? I'm a, well, you're not supposed to walk the toys. Only the toys can move if they can walk themselves. And then they're like, oh, let me take this back over to this center and put it there. And then now, do you want to go to that center? Well, no, I want to play with the blocks right now. Okay, well, then you can stay in the block center. And when you're done, you can walk over to the other toys and play with those toys as well or um, use those toys for your activity that you want to do. So one that I used to always tell them, toys don't have legs. They can't walk. So we can't have them walking in and out of centers all the time. And so, and they would say, toys don't have legs no toys don't have legs <laughs> they can't walk 
<laughs> and they would constantly say that to me. And parents would always come back and say that my kids, they won't bring their toys. So if they tell them, hey, bring those blocks into the living room, the kids would be like, but my toys don't have legs. They, they're not supposed to walk out of my room. <laughs> so... <laughs> You said I would tell them that all the time. Well, I, I love what you said so far about the introducing to the children and, and, and demonstrating what they should do with these things. So what else do you recommend? So um, not only showing them and demonstrating how to do what to do with them, the appropriate use. Like a lot of times we'll say, oh, here are Legos. You build with Legos. But giving them other ideas of what they can do with those Legos as well. Because when a child gets bored with a certain toy, they start finding different uses for them. So <laughs> if you do not give them a wide range of things that they can do with that particular activity that's on the shelf, then you're going to find Legos that are going to become hamburgers. You're going to find Legos that is going to become footballs. Or you're going to find Legos that's going to become pedals to pop other kids with. So we have to give them not just what a standard use for that is, but a range or an option of things that they can do with that particular um, activity and toy. I'm wondering too, if um, maybe having too much out in your center could also cause um, some dumping or misuse of tools type of behavior. So with toddlers, um, because they're entering in that sharing where you're wanting to teach them how to share, but then also understanding that that is not a lot of times in their zone of proximal development, like they're not ready for it yet. I always tell my teachers is that you don't want to overcrowd the shelf. So setting a limit of how many kids are in that center, let's just say you have a setup and you can allow three kids to go into that center and then having two options per kid. So which means that you'll have like about maybe six baskets on the shelf. Um, and if you notice that that's too much, then maybe set bring it back to have less options per kid. But you want to have a range, but do not have more than two to three options per kid that is allowed in that center. Otherwise, it will be toys all over the place. And then the more that they learn to share, the less that goes down. So then you can have less items in that center. The reason why you have a few more for toddlers is to reduce what we talked about, biting, um, to reduce um, hitting because of the sharing that could cause an issue in that center. So definitely watch how much you are putting on the shelves and make sure that there's options, but not so many that's going to cause the kids that are going to that center overwhelmed. So I stick to that two or three per kid that is allowed in that center. That's a good um, thing to keep in mind because you and I both know, like one year I had, I got this bus. I was so excited. I didn't have anything in my classroom. I wasn't supplied with anything. So I had to supply everything myself. Wow. And um, I found a Fisher Price bus at a garage sale. And I was super excited because I knew my kids would really like that. And I put it in the center, uh, just one. Mm, that did not go over so well because everybody wanted the bus. And so then I went hunting at another garage sale for another bus. Eventually, we got two buses and it was much better because now if I had, you know, four and five kids in that center, we could... It was easier to yes, share and take turns when it's with more than one. <laughs> two buses. Yeah. So everyone would get a turn with that bus or bus one of the two buses during center time if I had two. And so even mm -hmm. with four year olds, because that was with four year olds, they don't always share very well, especially when everyone wants a bus, you know, and especially <laughs> when they haven't been taught or been in an environment where they had to share. Many of them are the only child at home or um, they don't socially interact with other kids outside of preschool or outside of the classroom. So they don't know what it means. Mine, mine, mine. Everything is mine. And it is even, even worse with toddlers. It is my, my, my city. <laughs> exactly. It's very much so. I remember a few minutes ago, Carolyn, when you were talking about sharing in centers. And so maybe like you, how you were saying that kids um, go play and they don't know what that means. During during that time when they're when you're introducing that center to your students, do you do any type of modeling of how to play yes. as well? So one of my favorite activities to do is to pick a kid or two children who are in that center and I'll say, come on, friends, come watch how these friends use this game or this activity. And so I'll give it to both of them and I'll say, hmm, but what if your friend wants all of it? What is something that you can say if you want that toy from your friend? So a lot of behavior modeling 
as a part of showing them how to interact. And I do that with two kids. And so then sometimes it's myself and another child and I'll say, hmm, but I want to play with that. And the child will be like, well, I don't want you to play with that right now. And then I'll say, hey, so if you want to play with it, but yet that child is playing with that activity, you need to raise your hand or come over and get Miss Carolyn. And Miss Carolyn will set a timer so that that child knows that they have a few more minutes to play before having to allow the other child to play with with that activity. So I do model that and then teach them how to communicate that they want something from another kid for that kid to communicate that they're not ready to give up that item just yet, but then understand that there will be a timer set so that they know what to expect and it's not a surprise to them. And they kind of reduce the number of tantrums that I have within the center when trying to teach them how to share. Am I saying that it's not going to happen, that they're not going to get upset when the timer go off? No, but at least they're prepared and I can let them know what will happen if they get upset or um, what they can do when they're done with that activity. So I try to give them those heads up whenever we're playing in the center. Yeah, I really like the um, the modeling of oral language that you talked about there, because often we tell kids to share, 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 but they just don't have the words cool. yet. And, you know, please, may I have a turn? Like, that's not in their <laughs> vocabulary. Let's face it. <laughs> and it's so funny to see them model that especially when they're two and a half and three they'll go and they'll say can i have a turn can it can i have a turn and the other child and rightfully so will say no i'm not done yet and so then i give them the tools of what to do at that point because a lot of kids will be like well give it here anyway i'm gonna smack you because you didn't give me that toy so what does the child do next and so you have to give them the vocabulary and let them know what resources which is the teacher in the classroom available to kind of mediate between the two of them. I love that, um, especially with the toddler age group because they are just learning all about this whole thing, right? So you're really offering a lot of structure there to help support them. Um, and I think that that's what they need, right? Because toddlers, can, it, it can turn into a free for all real quick. Yes, Am I can. right? It can go from zero to 100. I've been in a classroom with a new teacher and I went in and I was in the classroom with her and I went to the bathroom for literally three minutes and I came back and every single toy, every single toy was on the ground that fast. They are fast little stinkers. So um, I think that that's super important. And then as they mature and grow and they go through the other developmental stages and they become, you know, more adept at me, maybe when I say adept, I don't mean like super rock stars at sharing, but like they've done it enough times now to know that it's a thing, you know, and they, they get the kind of the gist, not that they're mastering any of this. Then we can branch out, you know, we can start um, offering more choices to them and um, let, giving them a little more uh, leeway in, in, in the use of the toys and, and things like that. But I think that when you're talking about toddlers, it is a very slippery slope. Like this is their very first introduction to the whole thing. And I think that any, any pre-K-4 teacher out there will tell you they can instantly tell if a child in their class has been in a pre-K three or any kind of preschool or child care experience because those kids are just like, oh yeah, this is cool. And they, they just, know what to do. They're like little yeah. ducks and there's, yeah, they just follow along. Um, and, and your kids who have never been in, in any kind of setting before, it's like, whoa, I got to take this 20 steps back, you know? So super, super important. Okay. Is there anything else we can do to make the dumping, the running, and the, you know, just wandering any better? Yes. One thing that I um, tell my teachers is, like you just said, it can go downhill very fast, but you see those signs of it going downhill before it reached the bottom of the pit. So one of the tools that I tell teachers is that when you see one child dumping a few things out, immediately go over and address that situation and get those toys up so that it's not just boom, boom. Like you, you got to jump in real quick and stop the situation before it goes all the way downhill. So I had this case where um, I went into a class and it was puzzles everywhere. And a lot of times oh, with reflection yes. with teachers, I have to go back and show them like what it looked like on camera or go back and replay. The child dumped the puzzles on the floor and 
the teacher is still taking care of what she needs to take care of and she does not address. You validated that that was okay for that child to dump by not addressing the situation. Therefore, the child went and got another puzzle and dumped it over on the floor and you said it was okay by still not going over and addressing the situation. Before you knew it, three or four kids are dumping puzzles because they saw it was okay when they saw the other kid do it and nothing happened to them. So if you had addressed that child on that first or that second puzzle, it would not have led to four kids in the the manipulative center dumping puzzles and manipulatives on the floor because you would have addressed it, picked up that puzzle right then before that tornado kind of went spun out of control. And a lot of us don't address those things early on and try to gain that control before it gets out of control. So you have to be really on top of your toddler classroom up and rotating the class going from center to center so that you are addressing when you see that first dump and showing them hey you know i know you want to play with those toys on the floor but let's put them back in here and pull out just what we need so acting on those situations as soon as that happens will keep you going from going down that slippery slope really fast i love that you brought puzzles up because that is one of my pet peeves as well is Puzzles have always been a problem for a lot of the teachers I've worked with because um, if you don't have the right level of puzzle out for this, the age of the student in your classroom, you are going to get a lot of dumping of puzzles and abandonment of puzzles because they're too difficult for your students. You have to know where your students are developmentally. And if you have a child like in pre-K-4 who's delayed, um, if they want to play with the puzzles, I usually try to assign them a, a friend, make sure that there's a friend in their group who's a really good puzzle expert. But one thing we don't we don't want to do is if puzzles are an issue is to take the puzzles out of the room because they're super important for executive function yes. skill development. And we don't want to remove them. So I think that anyone out there who's like, oh, puzzles. Oh, I can't stand puzzles. They just dump them. It's always a problem. Remember what Carolyn said and, and also take comfort in knowing that, yes, puzzles can be a bit really tricky in the early childhood classroom, but we can do it based on using the information we're talking about today. You can have puzzles in your classroom because they are so super important for those executive function skills. We never and removing want to things out. does not solve the problem. They're just going to represent yes. themselves in another situation. Taking toys away doesn't make that problem go away in your classroom. But if you effectively teach them how to use that, that's just another opportunity for them to learn. And also they can apply those same skills to something else. So it, taking scissors out of the classroom, taking paint out of the classroom and puzzles is not going to keep kids from uh, making a mess. They're going to find something else to make a mess with. So teach them how to appropriately right. use those things. Do not remove them from their environment. Yes. Yes. And one last thing before we go, that was another one of my pet peeves is I don't believe that we should close centers when children have shown us that they can't handle the center or the materials or the interactions in that center, because then we're saying, okay, you can't handle it. I'm not going to teach you because I've already done that in my head. I've already You're done speaking that. Speaking to That's my spirit right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, yes. and, and then and then punish punish them by not letting them into that center, that's just robbing them of opportunities to develop the skills they actually need. So I don't want anyone to go down that road either because it's so easy. It's easy to remove the puzzles. It's easy to close the center. That's actually not what's not solving children. the problem. It's actually making it worse in long term yeah. speaking. Carolyn, I think that we got so much valuable information Thank you. From Thank you. Today. Thank you so much for offering this opportunity for me to be able to share with toddler teachers because they need it. They need more people advocating and giving them tools that they can use in the classroom. Absolutely. And again, this information is good for parents and teachers of older <laughs> children as well. I just love this Behavior Bites series. If you are listening or watching along and you like these Behavior Bites, this is a series that we're doing so you can stay tuned because Carolyn's gonna stick around um, in some upcoming episodes. Make sure you're subscribed. 
so you don't miss more of these behavior bites with Carolyn. Before we go, Carolyn, remind people of what you do and where they can connect with you if they like what you have to say. Um, I'm Carolyn Bob Green. I'm an early childhood um, advocate, I'm an early childhood professional, teacher, trainer. You can find me at training the letter U to succeed on Instagram, also on Facebook and on YouTube. I own an early childhood center called Adventures in Learning Academy, where I train and develop teachers to touch and inspire young children. So this is my passion, early childhood education. And I love sharing tips and tools with teachers on how to better sparkle in their classroom. Wonderful. Thanks to everyone out there watching. And thank you to Carolyn Bob Green for joining us today. Until next time. I'm Vanessa Levin, Onward and Upward. If you think these videos are valuable, you have got to come check out the Teaching Trailblazers program. Teaching Trailblazers is the place for teachers like you to get the professional development resources and support you need to thrive. It's where you can learn relevant, life-changing best practices with professional development created specifically around the challenges early childhood teachers face. It's where you can get access to a complete research-based pre-K curriculum that you can use either to supplement your existing curriculum or use on its own to get 100% of your students kindergarten ready by the end of the year. And it's where you can hang out and connect over all things early childhood with other teachers just like you and me. It's my favorite place on earth and it will change your teacher life, I guarantee it. Come join us at teachingtrailblazers.com to get more information and apply today. That's teachingtrailblazers.com. I can't wait to see you there.